Hi listeners, Jason here. We are excited to finally announce registrations for the biggest psych health and safety community event ever. The inaugural The Psych Health and Safety Conference will be held at the Sofitel Wentworth Sydney June 19 to 20, 2024 and offer concurrent virtual attendance. It'll feature live podcast recordings with OG researchers, including Christina Maslach and Michael Leiter of Burnout fame, Psych Health and Safety USA podcast host I, David Daniels, Australian super experts, including the likes of David Burrows, a special 10-year anniversary integrated approaches to workplace mental health panel with authors Tony LaMontagna, Angela Martin and Kat Page, hand-picked case studies from organisations doing it well, and a very special interview with plaintiff Zaggy Kozarov by Catherine Dunlop on that High Court case which we previously covered on the podcast. This event will sell out. Get in quick to secure tickets at early bird prices for the two-day conference, pre-conference masterclasses and the VIP dinner. The first 200 in-person registrations also get a copy of her latest book, The Burnout Challenge, signed by Christina Maslach herself. Find out more and register at www.psychhealthandsafetyconference.com. Now, on to this episode. From Flourish DX, this is the Psych Health and Safety Canada podcast. With workplace mental health becoming a priority for businesses who want to retain staff and prevent burnout, this is the source of information for creating sustainable and psychologically healthy workplaces in Canada. Well, thanks for joining the Psych Health and Safety podcast in Canada. My name is Ian Lewis, and I'm one of the hosts of the podcast. And I'm really grateful that Jay Lamont is joining us today. Jay and I have worked together professionally over the last 15 years. We've become friends. And so welcome, Jay. Thanks, Ian. Excited uh, to spend some time with you this morning. Yeah. And uh, Jay is someone that I have really respected over the years in terms of uh, him being involved in new and different things. And it was actually Jay who introduced me to psychological health and safety as a concept and the National Standard of Canada for Psychological Health and Safety. So thanks so much, Jay, for, for doing that and uh, really admire a lot of the work you've been doing. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Uh, thanks for the kind comments, Ian. Yeah. Well, and you know, so with that kind of cliffhanger of uh, gathering interest, uh, can you give us, our listeners and our, our viewers just a little overview of how you got into health and safety and where your winding journey has taken you so far? Yeah, sure. Love to. I uh, It has been an interesting journey through a, a couple of different uh, paths, connecting paths, but I uh, got an uh, original degree in the health sciences field, but we would consider kinesiology. Uh, and uh, in the 90s, and that took me in and started my career in a physiotherapy clinic and working as a clinician, as many people do, working with injured workers and um, both involved with psychological challenges and physical challenges, et cetera, mm-hmm. uh, moved and transitioned from that into a consulting area and worked for uh, a larger consulting firm in Western Canada, had uh, a lot of leadership uh, exposure there and uh, led a number of offices in Western Canada, all around supporting insurers, employers, et cetera, around individuals with longer term disability and challenges, um, had that career for some time involved you know, a lot of travel commitments, et cetera, raising a young family at the same time was, was, was a challenge. And I found an opportunity uh, at a local employer that was looking at investing and developing along around the excellence Canada framework at the time. So this is, you know, early mid two thousands. Yeah. And uh, that framework was all, it was, it was back then there was a lot of interest around total quality management programs. And this one was around business excellence, but also, also excellence in healthy workplace. So it identified a framework of, and, and a standard for employers, you know, should they choose to accept the mission uh, to improve their workplace against a number of standards. And so that was physical environment health and wellness promotion or personal health and wellness promotion. And at that time, it was really <clears throat> interesting to me. And it was emerging a lot of the research academic and field around psychological safety in the workplace and an employee, you know, in between their ears in the workplace. So that was a part of that structure. I really enjoyed that time uh, and uh, uh, worked with uh, with this with this group who's ISC of Saskatchewan. That I think they're quite proud of the work that we had done there. And within a four, four and a half year term, we became the 
uh, the healthiest workplace in Western Canada following that path. And I really enjoyed my time. And that's where I started to cut my teeth in working around and appreciating the importance of psychological safety in the workplace and how that is uh, developed a passion for me, where I, I thought I might want to go. It Around that time, having worked in a clinical structure, working with the, uh, and consulting to a couple of employers, and now just dabbling into sort of the organizational health design, which has always been a passion of, of mine too, is looking at frameworks within an organization and opportunities to improve the experience for health and growth for health in an organization. But uh, it was around that time where I thought, you know, we do a pretty good job in Saskatchewan and Canada around in people with physical injuries. You know, somebody has, um, you know, a knee problem or mechanical back pain or a systemic uh, health uh, uh, problem or disability. We have a lot of structure in the community and healthcare. Employers can do a pretty good job. But when it comes to people that are ill or injured or developing some, some home challenges or health challenges, whether it's mental illness or emerging mental health challenges, there was not a lot of structure and support. And, and I think more to what we'll, we'll likely talk about this morning, more around employees and or, uh, management and senior management being able to understand and help individuals when they see that and what to do. Uh, so enjoy my time there. Did some consulting independently once, you know, uh, went after we had reached that milestone and, uh, but recognized and, and changed got a lot of training and certifications. And I really, my passion shifted around psychological safety and mental health in the workplace. And um, as you know, I teach mental health first aid. Uh, I have for a number of years, I teach road to mental readiness, psychological trauma and peer support in first responder communities. I learned so much from both of those groups when I work with them. Uh, I've learned, you know, from all those classes, um, especially working with first responders around, you know, requirements and, and supports in, in the area. And, you know, I was looking for an employer that I, I recognize working independently and popping in and out and having some impact with employers, um, you know, can have a certain amount of impact. But I was looking for an employer that wanted to make a significant commitment internally and in developing a framework around psychological safety, you know, already having a robust safety framework, but then being curious and recognizing what about the mental health of our employees? And so for a number of years now, I've been at the city of Regina, been a terrific employer around supporting this venture, developed a corporate mental health strategy uh, for the last number of years we've been following and uh, a psychological safety framework. And uh, and I also have had and continued with uh, with private practice work and supporting employers, keynote speaking and that sort of thing. Uh, so, you know, today I'm really happy to take a vacation day and spend the morning with you, um, you know, and, and providing some opportunities for people to learn about that. So so that kind of took it for me. That was probably the larger version of the short version you're looking for. Ian, but. <laughs> well, no, but I, I think it I think it shows people, though, that sort of natural development where, you know, you're working internally in a company, you've, you, you're you seeing the firsthand effects of mental health in the workplace and you want to do more. Uh, and then when you land with the city that it's like, you know what, I've got this job to be, I've got this opportunity to be embedded in an organization and while you're not here representing the city of Regina today or anyone else, you're here representing yourself as a practitioner in psychological health and safety. But really what you're bringing to our viewers, our listeners, is that field experience about, well, how do you talk about psychological health and safety in an organization? What are some of the salient variables that you've observed that you're working with? And so you're bringing that wealth of experience and, uh, Jay, every time we meet, you just open my eyes to more stuff and more insights. And so I think it's really important that um, being a practitioner in the field, you know some stuff that works. We all know the, the what. It's really important to pay attention to uh, workplace factors. But how? Right. And and so that that how is is really, really important. And I think that's where our listeners really need the the benefit of getting people who are practitioners in the field learning about the how. Sure, the academic stuff is really important too, but people feel paralyzed. They don't feel confident that they can move this ball forward. And um, right. 
that's what you're doing. So I think it's really great. Thanks, Ian. And you know, something that I'd recognize um, in many employers that I've worked with and connected with and friends and, and colleagues in the industry is that more and more in the last um, <clears throat> four, six, eight, ten years, employers, the expectations of employees and leaders and uh, inside the container of work is further and further increased. The focus on strategy, the focus on objectives and outcomes, doing same or more with less, that piece drives an organization to work at a, a really high pace. Mm -hmm. And although organizations and great individuals within it have a desire for better and a better work experience and a healthier mm -hmm. environment and all of the things that we can talk about and want to you know, laterally influence, one of the first challenges across the board of all employers is it's not like they're sitting with 10% of their time to say, hey, I wonder what we could do with this. Let's read some things. Let's hire somebody to come in for a talk. Like they're all out all day. And unfortunately, many people more than a 40 hour week. So, you know, we'll talk about it this morning. But one of the things that I often think about is how to honor that and respect that. And when people say, you know, I just don't have time, that is true. But also look for opportunities to say, this isn't more, this isn't um, additional time. It's what are we doing with our time? What are the ways that we can be a little different or intentional with the time that we already have? And so I found, you know, when I've stood up and fall down on, on a few things and we have the things that don't work in different uh, companies, but that's something that I've learned is to be really creative and finding opportunities with the time that they're already uh, that they already have to perhaps do things in a, just a little different way. Right. And so when we think about, you know, the work, the workplace, the worker, you're like, yeah, we can't add time to everyone's day, but if we can change how the work is done, right, we're going to maybe going to make some difference here. And so you're, you're not saying, Hey, we need a, a suddenly a different program and a different way of doing things, but let's refine and let's make really good use of what we have in our time and maybe change up our methods a bit. Yeah, for sure. So we don't need another staff meeting to talk about psychological safety and things we want to do. We need to observe our current staff meeting. This is just an example I'm thinking of. We need to observe as a leader, our current structure and staff meeting, who's talking, when, what does the agenda look like? You know, is it balanced contribution? Are there some eye rolls? Like, are there some really flagrant things that, oh, you know, we already have this container of a staff meeting that if I actually took the time, let somebody else run the agenda and took some time to be quiet and observe, you know, it's just sort of that. I think that that's a concept that I'm trying to to look for is look at um, the, the gold of opportunity that we already have. Right. So you're really speaking to leadership and you completed your Master of Arts in Leadership at uh, and at Royal Roads University, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. And uh, I guess what really kind of drove you to do that? And and what did you find in your research? Like, um, yeah, I'm really curious about that. I think listeners would get a lot from that. Uh, you know, I think it was a couple of things that uh, why did I decide as an adult to take any discretionary hours that I had for three years <laughs> three hours out of my life? Right. Yeah. Uh, I, I think it was a combination of a couple of things. One, I had I was taking a. Um, a professional certificate in, in leadership, like a development program. And through it, you know, halfway through working on modules around values-based leadership and authenticity. And I found myself so enthralled. I think I was probably sitting there at the table the, the couple of days with my mouth open, so enthralled at the material. And it was, you know, almost like I'd been waiting to talk about these things or be connected at a table with other people for a long time and hadn't it's so directed. I know that sounds a little dramatic or uh, what that would be, but it was that. And it also a funny thing that I'd had throughout my career that I, I've always had to take five minutes to explain to somebody what I do for a living. You know, I'm not a plumber or a teacher or a <laughs> yeah. firefighter or, you know, people get that. And I'd have to talk about, you know, what happens in workplaces and sometimes people get injured and then we can help people if, you know, they're struggling with different issues and, and I help leaders or I develop a program or... We, you know, I have a five minute story, even for my parents to describe what that is. And so I feel like I found leadership. I, I found that there's, a, okay, maybe this is my North Star here. So I, I, I looked, I researched and, and found what I, what I believe to be 
a top program in, in Canada at Royal Roads University of Masters of Leadership. So I went off in that venture. I was tell you, I, you know, being mid-career and, you know, just a town, town kid from Campsack, I, I, I did have some, some real imposter syndrome heading out there. I mean, who yeah. am I? Who am I to go out and do this with a cohort of 48 other people across Canada? You know, they only take 100 a year individuals. And um, so <clears throat> I, I entered into that forum with the thought that this is going to help me in in, in my practice and how I can um, elevate and, and support and learn. Because I do believe, uh, certainly I, I believe in all the 13 psychosocial factors in the national standard all have a high influence and a contribution to improving the workplace. But when we look at the factor of clear leadership and expectations, we look at the fact that there's numerous research out there that would identify that the number one factor um, to improve employee well-being, improve engagement, and, and, and support retention of employees is their relationship with their manager. That number one piece, not workload, not, I mean, that influences workload, but that piece. And so recognizing, I think this is a program that can can support that. And uh, so I was curious about it, uh, about leadership. And uh, I had shared with you once before when we were connecting that I had this thought out there that I'm going to go away for a couple of years and learn from the best. And I'll, and I'll come back and tell everybody what the best leadership is. And then I'll write it down for them. And then they'll go and do that. Yeah, like you're going to get this this epiphany and yeah. download it to everyone. There's yeah, one way. I'm going to go to BC and get it. I'll bring it back to Saskatchewan and, you know, impose my wisdom on everyone. And there is no right way or best way or particular style. And, of course, I, I guess it was somewhat naive because I think I could have read that in a book or somebody would have published that book. <laughs> um, but the journey that I had was in understanding and um, recognizing that you know connecting to and leaders taking the time to develop a practice like that this is a practice leadership isn't the top box on an organizational chart i mean it kind of is but it really is a practice of being and supporting and inspiring and all of those things that um, an individual has and leaders come in all forms in the organization too you know, everybody leads self, at, at least if not teams and others, and they lead their own behaviors, et cetera. Um, but they they have a, a journey through our workplace and in the community and our families and our homes and our volunteer mm -hmm. work as well um, to develop a practice of how to influence and align and, and inspire others. And uh, so I, I just had a magical couple of years and time to do some research on that piece. So that's cool. And so leaders are pivotal in the organization. Um, but you talk about connection then. And so your research then, what did you sort of dive into to really look at leadership? Mm -hmm. So I was able to, the uh, my employer was was uh, happy to be a sponsored support the the research and use that opportunity with a large organization multifaceted organization that was had already made a commitment right so i thought okay a commitment and a commitment from leaders a lot of wonderful leaders that really want to learn more um be better for their employees and and whatnot and so i felt like it's it's more about how do we research in a way to support leaders in this change so this is going to be an evolution and a change of ways that we do things, small things, big things, sometimes quick and a few things that'll take a number of years to advance. Right. Um, so the uh, I do have some notes to reference here. So the title of research change leadership to advance psychological safety. So it's the leadership practices of change. How how do we do that? And there's a lot of work around that, you know, agile change and individuals can get a lot of training and sport and academic support around that but this is about okay advancing psychological safety something a little bit different in the workplace not change management we have a new project of you know making more effective widgets or something like that this is about so many human factors and emotions and things at play um so I wanted to also identify in in this particular organization what could we learn 
by um, connecting with leaders, connecting with employees in a qualitative research project, uh, a pretty large and robust qualitative research project, what can we learn that we can apply across many organizations in ways that employees have the best opportunity to be followers in the change and leaders can identify what are those behaviors and strengths and things that I need to espouse and adopt they're going to um, help advance this as, as smoothly as possible. Because there was already a commitment in this organization around psychological health and safety. Done a couple of cycles of guarding minds at work, surveys implemented, uh, a lot of different action items, et cetera. But this was about those pieces. Right. And so you're getting right then in the, in the nitty gritty of how do leaders behave in a way that fosters psychological health and safety and you know, psychological health and safety from the viewpoint of the followers and the the participants in there. Right. And it's not the the interesting piece is it's not mutually exclusive, you know. So I also wanted to, as part of um, the academic component of that research and all of the lit review and you well know what that journey is like. And and again, those all those discretionary hours of life uh, to do that researched uh some of the themes and components around followership you know what is the influence of and then what does that mean for followership for employees to um feel like they're in a space to make a commitment have that trust to make that commitment to to perhaps um follow what these practices and changes are by the leaders but um so I found a couple of unique things. I'll just like yeah. quickly say these are this is how we we sort of focus the framework. The other piece that I want to identify is I actually identified three uh, leaders in the organization to help support and frame what we wanted to look at look like for the, the leadership um, from different areas that uh, have understanding of you know deep understanding of the organization to help develop uh, what it is we want to look look at. So how might we identify leadership styles conducive to sustainable positive behavior change? And and I emphasize sustainable positive change in that you know mm-hmm. that, that we can work on. How might we encourage open-minded, curious followership behaviors that walk others in the direction of the vision? Mm-hmm. So there's a lot there, but really, you know, are they in a space to follow? How do we encourage open-mindedness in employees um, to, to advance that? And then how might we harvest an inventory of current state psychologically safe behaviors we want to promote in advance? So that idea that, you know, you leverage the best things that are already going on. Let's not forget that in any organization, there's there is always a lot of great work. There are always a lot of really motivating, inspiring leaders that mm-hmm. um, are already working well advanced in this. Like, let's make sure that we can elevate that and leverage that and not just look for some of the, the biggest challenges, right? Right. And so what you're talking about, Jay, is as you're entering the research, uh, maybe I'll just set some context. You're working yeah. for an organization that is incredibly diverse. There are mm-hmm. white collar workers, there are supervisors, leaders, there's tradespeople, there's laborers, and there is a really diverse workforce. So you're saying that we want to harvest the leadership behaviors, but we also want to understand what helps followers to really contribute and to sort of um, not just be responsive to the leaders, but to be able to contribute and add to that workplace environment. It's everybody's responsibility. Yeah. And so it's not just that if the leaders behave in a certain way. Yeah, bang, this is going to happen in the workers. and They're going to jump up and they're going to contribute. You're researching what is it going to take to help the, the workers contribute and help create this psychologically safe workplace. And this well, is a joint, this is a joint unionized environment. Um, and yeah, yeah lot, lots of, I guess, interesting things. And it's not just a monolithic guarantee. If we do this, we get X. Right. So spending the first um, uh, first energies and time, and what I wanted to understand is how in an organization um, do you create that container that can advance change and that container that is a safe container that's an open-minded and curious one that everyone comes along because this is not instructional. This is not in any way directional leadership that is going to work here. It's about really identifying, excuse me, what 
what is the vision? What are, what are we working towards? It's a, it's a continual journey, you know, continually advancing a, a more healthy and creative workplace to foster. I'm trying to think of some of the language too uh, that I think about fostering the full productivity of employees, mm-hmm. you know, that, that piece where we continually open up and open up so that employees can um, work within and be proud of their work and a hundred percent of their abilities, you know, so creating a container at the first of what are we trying to work towards here? It's about being kind to each other. It's about some of those day-to-day mechanics and expectations that we want to have in a great workplace, but it's also about, yeah, I think that creating that container is kind of the way I like to frame it. So that container then as, you know, people commute to work, they're like, all right, you know what? I have all this ability. I have, I have what I have. And they arrive at the doors of work and there might be a lot of factors then at work that limit them that say that, you know what, I can't contribute because, well, I'm going to be in a meeting that, you know, people just get shut down or, you know what, I'm in a place where, you know, they don't value me because of my accent. I'm in a place where this happens. And so you're talking about creating an entirely different container than for work that allows people to essentially thrive and bring their whole selves. Right. And I think that that also enters with a couple of examples you, you had said. Yeah. Like why, why is it when, when an individual drives to work with a hundred percent of their abilities and education and aptitudes and I, ideally energy, you know, they're arriving with their own mental level of mental fitness and mental health. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, but but wham when they hit the door that drops to 71 percent or 52 percent or or 89 percent or whatever that is i i'm i'm curious about the gap and what are those components that could be around our our thoughts around psychological safety and uh you know to that end i'd like to to name and i speak to it a lot is that people can get confused between what is psychological safety you know the responsibility of organizations around uh the framework of psychological safety and a person's individual mental health uh wellness illness mental fitness etc as well those are not you know mutually exclusive they impact each other but the recognition that um that within a psychologically safe environment, individuals come to the workplace. And that's where we en- can enter some of the framework ideas, some of the things uh, like we talk about in Canada, the in Canada, we, we, our standard is to use the National Center for Psychological Health and Safety. We talk about things around involvement and influence and rewards and recognition and clear leadership expectations, and all of these components, the, that framework, and looking at chunking out some individual um, pieces that influence that, whether it's policy, process, et cetera, is a way, I believe, to clearly make improvements to advance while alongside we're developing leaders, we're developing behaviors in the workplace, expectations, uh, helping to navigate and shift culture in a way that supports a healthier environment. I think that, that there's just like really two pieces there and say it's a little biased because I do believe the the high influence of leadership uh, on that impact on that culture. Um, yeah. So, in your research and in your practice, um, then what are you finding about the role that leaders play in psychological health and safety? Like, unpack that for us. Like, when when it sort of boots on the ground and someone's like, "How do I be a leader?" Then that really promote psychological health and safety uh certainly policy organizational structures whatnot are really important but but what have you found in your in your research and your practice about what makes a psychologically uh, safe leader then so first and foremost i think that we need to recognize and honor the um, diverse nature of, of of leaders one thing that I would say is that I can say over, and I've had a, you know, I'm getting pretty gray hair here, and I've had a longer career, but I have met and I've had the privilege of working alongside and learning alongside so many wonderful leaders and so many diverse leaders. I have yet to meet one that doesn't care about people, mm. right? Um, not only care about people, but want to do the right thing for their people in the workplace and want to create an environment where there's a lot of enthusiasm and creativity and innovation and laughter and, and a sense of family. 
like that. I haven't found a leader that 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 isn't their their foundational goal. So I think recognizing that is really critical and, and understanding that. And there's <clears throat> influence you can have at a macro level, but I, I don't believe that you can ignore the one-on-one -on -one relationships and supports that individuals need for themselves. And so that's where I would offer when we look at the um the field of leadership, right? Or the the yeah, the field of leadership. We can have wonderful leadership development training. We can define what our expectations are, are in the workplace of our leaders. We can create policies and of course the structure around strategic planning and all these systems that we work in. Those are all great. Let's let's do that really well. But we also have to influence and recognize leaders need to develop their own personal practice. They have to develop a leadership practice for themselves that works, that's genuine, authentic, and that they can do uh, that is um, driven intrinsically when nobody else is watching uh, and, and, and those expectations aren't there. So that to say, I, I really believe that it's important for leaders that are starting on this journey and want to want to create some change in, in their work environment, et cetera, need to start with themselves first. And that well, can take some, some time. Right. And what would they be looking at themselves, though? Because like that introspective look to say, well, should I be working on my budgeting or my financial analysis skills? Should I be doing this? Should I be doing that? Should I be trying to you know get better at the the, the craft of our, our industry? You know, should I be learning to watch the markets? Like where would they start with developing themselves? I think that the answer is partly in what you said in the examples that you have. They will ultimately spend time and be required to spend time on their budget and on improving their performance within the industry um, or products or services they need to advance. They're doing that. And it's not hard to convince them of that because they don't want to fail in, in, yeah. the, in their duties and, and what the, the discharge of what they're expected to do. But at the same time, I think it is about introducing, if if not if it hasn't already been introduced, but introducing the respect of the the fact that they need to invest in themselves and their own leadership practice and advance that alongside. And it's not more; it's about spending some time, as we had started our conversation, spending some time to recognize what can I do differently um, with the practices and the time that I already have. You know, in the precious time are those connections with employees. Mm -hmm. How can I maximize that time with employees? Not spending more time having more meetings, but when I already have that connection, what are the things that I can recognize and develop in, in myself? And I think that that's, that's some of the, the you know, primary and, and first step work that can be, can be challenging for some employees, that, that, that piece where, where I, tend to, and, th and this isn't uh, in any way unique to my thoughts, is talk to leaders about values. I love, you know, people I'm sure are annoyed at me and when I say value, oh, Jay always wants to say, are you connected to your values? Are you leading with your values? Do your values align with your corporate values? And I have this with different corporations and talk, and I want to start there. Are, do you know, this is a big statement, but do you know who you are? Hmm. Um, and when you say who you want to be, and you and and who you want your employees and your colleagues uh, and your customers and your vendors, et cetera, to see you. Who is that person? What are your core values? Because we lead best with our core values. When we're in alignment with that, that's when we're most effective. Do you need more psych health and safety in your life? Then head over to the Flourish DX Academy for several free on-demand e-learning courses. If you're an internal professional, follow Flourish DX on Eventbrite to register for any of our free fortnightly interactive webinars. Our flagship professional practice program is also exclusively available for internal professionals. The 12-week course blends theory, applied practice, and interaction with other professionals through live lectures and a monthly community of practice session. Find out more about all these learning opportunities or inquire about a bespoke in-house training at the Flourish DX Academy www.45003.org. Now back to this episode. All right. So if, if a leader says my core values, what I identify most with is being an expert, being the negotiator, being the guy that carries the ball across the finish line. 
Um, yeah. Are those the values that the leader needs to espouse or is there something different that I know you've said there's not one perfect yeah. leader, but, but what are some of the values that might contribute to a psychologically um, healthy and safe leader? Right. So those, the three that you described, those, yeah. those are their core values. They connect with them. That's important. And we're not going to change those. Right. Okay. So those are going to help influence and, and uh, we, I mean, nor do we want to try and change those. Those are going to help influence um, their success in the workplace. But they may need to then recognize the other individuals around them may need to be looking at the more human side of work or how do we connect with the human capital of work that's not around high performer or those three things that you sort of identified, right? Yeah. Those are those are where they connect and they value certainly to the outcome on the on that on that spectrum. Yeah. But earlier uh ones, and and I would say this is what come out came out of um this research. And I spent a lot of time in academics and, and um, literature around here, and it connected to a lot of what I found as well. Employees and leaders require connection with each other and their contributions within the workplace, like to be um, um, to be most successful. And I think to answer your question, what, what I could offer that, that was in the findings, employees want authentic leaders to listen actively and to feel their voices acknowledged, valued, and respected. So that that worthiness and being heard, what the employees want. So I believe the leaders that we're talking about where they say, those are my three values. I'm going to be successful here. I lead people. I have the responsibility for the health, safety, motivation, inspiration of people need to recognize, okay, to be successful for the individuals that I have, this is what's connecting them. How can I recognize and build into my leadership practice those behaviors, observed behaviors, and actions and attitudes around authentic leaders that can listen actively. And, you know, another term that came up in qualitative research, as you would know, uh, in a lot of the um, data the construction and reconstruction that you do, you're looking at for verbiage and words. And the word vulnerability popped up, popped up, popped up, popped up. Authenticity, values, authenticity popped up um, a lot through the research. And I found that that was consistent uh, across literature that I found as well. And people would say, or perhaps would have that perception that, well, there's people that are just, you know, naturally those open, softer hearted, vulnerable, you know, Brene Brown would would say all these things, or Adam Grant would describe all these the people as a certain way. So I was curious, actually, in my research too, are you either born to be somebody that is value-based and vulnerable, et cetera, or is that something that can be learned? And some of the research that was just at the beginning of the, the uh, COVID pandemic highlighted that vulnerability is a skill, like a muscle we can build. Okay. So if you don't feel that that's your default as a leader, you know, you see that in some other leaders and maybe you think, oh, geez, I just wish I was a little more like Kim or Jerry or Susan or um, that's something that for practitioners like yourself and and I, we can look to help support leaders in developing those skills because that's what employees are looking for to create that cont container that they can follow. Right. So what you're talking about is the what, the goal, the outcome um, that you're looking at from a leadership perspective then is that leaders would be authentic, that they would be vulnerable, that they would establish a connection, right? So that's the goal, that their leadership behaviors would be observed to be inclusive, that they are um, involving others, that they're inviting feedback, that they are, you know, mindful themselves. And so they're really exercising some of those different behaviors or muscles. Mm -hmm. um, is, that, is that a fair summary of what the outcome of what yes. you sort of desire and see? Right. And I don't think, you know, it could be... Um, I just for for any leaders that are listening or that that will be yeah. this week pushed along along to them for for their consideration please don't think that it is a big monstrous hill to to climb break it down like you break down any other systems that you have when you got a big task and you think oh my gosh there's no way we'll get there in the next 2 years chunk it out and what can you do start with some small goals i mentioned before now i'm now i'm moving into advice here ian i don't know okay. what you're looking at you're but, qualified uh, <laughs> thanks um but 
look at it something like a that safety meeting, you know, or sorry, not safety meeting, but your your staff or a safety meeting, right? Or any other structure that that you have. Observe, create a goal for yourself for the next 12 months. First, observe what your behaviors are in there. What would you like differently when we have people gathering in a particular center or, or area? And likely the most opportunity for the direct connection, right? Spend some time looking and listening to your own behaviors, expectations, how well you um, are interacting there. Are you consuming all the space and oxygen in the room? Like our staff meetings, 95% the leader talking. And and legit, like that can happen mm-hmm. and, and, and leaders don't see it in themselves. So are you stifling innovation and self-confidence and growth in others around the room because you feel you already know the answers and you're just going to be passing that along and thou shalt it in the room. So, you know, I'm going down a bit of a path here, but to, to recognize um, opportunities and, and create some small goals for yourself around what you can see that those spaces could be better. And by the way, I'll be very transparent. I was just describing something that I've been working on in my own practice for the last two or three years. <laughs> okay. Not be a professional blurter to not finish sentences for people, to not be so excited, you know, in any opportunity or a coffee shop or in in a meeting to to share what I think is just so exciting. I I need to make myself smaller in spaces to allow that for others. So that's just, I'll use my own example there. Right. So that does, as I try to finish your sentence for you, Jay, sorry, I'm blurting in. (laughs) But what what you're talking about though, so if a leader is, self-aware and they've sort of said, I'm going to work on my leadership practice. And I've heard that it's really important to invite my followers in that they need to be understood, that there needs to be some, uh, they need to feel like allies in the process here. And, oh boy, we're in a joint labor environment here and I'm going to take some risks. And, And they look and say, I want to develop these practices. You say, start small. And so within the organization, then how have you helped leaders Or in your practice in general, how have you helped leaders sort of make that shift? You know, if someone says, "Hey, I've been, I'm, I'm, I got 95 percent of the airtime in in a staff meeting," like how are you helping them change that leadership behavior? And and maybe then, like, how do their followers respond? Like boots on the ground, this is how it's going. What do you see? Yeah, I there's different opportunities that that one has. And some of it can be found in if you if you start to go down a, a formal path of creating a psychologically safe work environment and and you know um, surveying or recognizing just observing or using different tools to identify some pretty obvious concerns or or um, opportunities that a that a leader might have you can have a one on one opportunity and say hey you know what I've seen in other spaces. And I often try to lead uh, the conversation by for for them to understand. Hey, I'm I have some things that I want to talk about. Just about the way that I've observed you are in in meetings or some. You know, hey, you just led that last session. It's got some ideas. I like to start by saying, just so you know, I have the gift of doing this for my job and reading these things and talking to people. So um, if I if I'm providing some ideas and advice. It's not like you should have already had these ideas. You're coming with like from somebody, I I like to create that awareness for them that I get to have that Mm -hmm. exactly saying there, but I start that conversation. I think it's important that you create a, create a a safe conversation first, I guess is what I'm saying. And that that's what I try to create that opportunity is say with humility, I get to do this all day. So I should have some good ideas and advice. And then invite them to think about the one, two, or three things that might not have landed well in a conversation or might not have been the most effective approach to introduce a concept. You know, I'm just making this up now, given that there was something most recent in the culture of that department or that industry, if they're in, you know, if they're in the oil and gas industry, or if something's going on, if I'm working and helping a group in the financial industry, then, you know, creating that connection, something's a little bit different in different groups as well. But um, yeah, I, I think that there's individual opportunities. There's also recognizing as, as corporations at that macro level, 
what do they want to do to advance the education and understanding um, for leaders within it as well? Right. So the leader values, um, they need to sort of check in with their values and say, like, do I have leadership values that really espouse or really say that it's important to have a connection with employees that they feel heard, that they feel they've got um, sort of a, a relationship. Um, and, and so leaders need to sort of check in with that. And you say, start small, um, look for opportunities, maybe think of things that didn't land well and how you might, you know, do that differently uh, in the future. Right. Is, the, is there some sort of like, check box, like start here, do these and just like check it off or, or what is the, what does leadership journey look like? Cause we're talking about people in all sorts of different industries from, you know, someone who leads a finance group of, um, you know, highly trained CPAs or a uh, construction superintendent who um, has a workforce that constantly changes with union call-ups. Like, it's not just a straightforward kind of leadership check the boxes. I've got this. So like, right. I'm, uh, like how, how would you encourage a leader to sort of develop a lot of, a lot of those? Yeah. Well, while I would recognize and appreciate that in different industries, the work can be different, mm -hmm. the expectation and the impact of the work on the employee's health, can be different in different industries. You know, we think of the, the old Eisenhagen model of work, workplace and the worker mm -hmm. um, that we used 20 years ago in ergonomics, right? But if you, if you the influence of one, while I appreciate that in different industries and different work, um, that can be different. I don't believe that the needs of employees is different. Right. The requirements of employees to feel that they have opportunities for growth, to feel that they... Uh, can speak up when they see something's wrong, that they can be part of something bigger and more dynamic. Yeah, that they can that they have a worthy voice and can be heard. These are things I know that they're kind of globby and soft and whatever however you'd sort of describe mm -hmm. those things. Those are consistent across all industries. And when a leader can recognize, you know, we're going to we're going to be excellent at the work we do. We're going to find efficiencies. We're going to build process things. We're going to bigger, faster, stronger. Like th that can all happen. But the more that they can actually uh, humble themselves and recognize. I will get more value in investing on how to create an environment where those employees can be more effective. You know, through worthiness and being heard. Safe to say what you think, you know, that's it. That's a big one. If it's not safe to say what you think, you don't get any of those things out of employees. You're not yeah. going to, all the innovative ideas are with the employees. So if there isn't an open, creative atmosphere that's safe there for to get that information from them, you, you'll never be as effective as you can be. So that's why, again, I have some bias because I spent my career in the people industry and, and that I believe that human capital is the number one predictor of, of successful outcomes in a business. So I, I think that that's where where leaders can look to. There is one piece, and um, that that I think speaks to this: leaders who demonstrate traits of empathy and authenticity inspire followers to demonstrate psychologically safe behaviors and influence positive change in workplace culture. So, demonstrating traits of empathy and authenticity inspire followers. Do you mean and, if they if they do it, they're inspiring their followers to do the same? They're they're creating permission. They're they're growing right. that. People have innately, you know. Sometimes relationships get damaged. Things happen. You know, people make errors or whatever. But innately, their their default is to look up to leaders. Mm -hmm. And if they see leaders being like them, you know, normal, make mistakes. Um, you know, hard words to say three hard words to say is I don't know, mm -hmm. you know, when they can see a leader, especially that's a time that seems to be highly charged and, and it's crisis. And the leader starts with, Hey, look, I don't know. I don't have the answers. Can we start from there? Um, or, Hey, sitting down with, a, a <clears throat> they maybe had a, a difficult conversation recently that they maybe weren't at their best. Um, they didn't appreciate their behaviors. They blurred it, you know, they yelled at an employee. 
something like that um, yeah. has occurred. And that's not their traditional approach. But factors happen and people make mistakes. To go back, sit down in, in a private space and say, hey, I'd like to have a do-over. Can I have a do-over? So as you... It actually you makes me emotional, but that is such a powerful component yeah. for, for a leader. And if leaders want to create connection and growth, if creating connection is going to be, you know, a really rapid um, uh, advancement within a relationship and building trust within an employee... Mm -hmm. Sitting down and, and doing that can can uh, be incredibly impactful. So what you're talking about is, I hear two themes there. You you've you've undoubtedly coached some leaders who have done that. They've they've recognized that whatever they did went over like a lead balloon. It was it was a terrible demonstration of great leadership practice. Mm -hmm. um, they asked for a do over. Um, do you have some stories, you know, obviously confidentially and whatnot, that where you can, you've had a leader who's like, yeah, you know what? I changed some of my practices. I checked in with my values and I did things to be authentic, to invite, to um, be allies with my, with my work group. Is there anyone you can talk to that said, I saw a change in the employee experience? Cause that's what we're here for. We're, we're here to, be great leaders so that we can change the employee experience that they can have better health outcomes that they can thrive and they can give their best to work. So when they come and they can use that hundred percent when they get to the doors, do you have, do you have some examples of how someone maybe noticed yeah. changes? I think it can happen. I've seen it happen where uh, somebody has been leading in an area for some time mm -hmm. and then they feel they got, they get stuck. Or I've also seen where there's a, a, a fairly quick awareness when somebody is in three, three weeks, three months, three years into a new, uh, leading a new group of individuals where they feel like they're stuck and they cannot seem to get anything um, to create. Be careful with my words here. Um, to be able to in, inspire or, or engage their employees more than what they have. Right. If they've recognized, you know, there's something more that based on the, the, the employees in this area that can help advance our work. You know, we've really worked through systems and efficiencies and things and technology and training and all those um, hard components, but those softer components, they, they just feel that they're stuck with that group of employees and then had some conversations with them about, okay, what has your part been in it? What have you been doing to do something different? Um, you know, if nothing changes, nothing changes. Mm -hmm. Really, uh, when it reminds me of my, one of my favorite quotes. Quotes is Barack Obama: "Hard things are hard, right? Yeah. But sometimes just simple thoughts are. If nothing changes, nothing changes. And introspectively." What have you done? What could you be doing different? So let's break this down. Can we chunk it out to the connections that you're having? Um, what is it that you that has worked in the past that seemed to uh, advance or engage and motivate people? Um, have you asked anybody? When's the last time you had some pulled out some vulnerable questions with the employees and, and said, hey, I'm wondering how I can do better or be better? <laughs> Did you, what'd you do with the most recent employee survey? Or have you ever done an employee survey? Have you done a psychological safety survey? And what were those results? Did you, did you, did you lean in and dig out some things? You know, if we, I don't know what our time's looking at, uh, like here, but I, I like to tell you a story around safe to say what you think. Okay. So I was consulting a number of years ago with an employer um, and, you know, quite commonly employers will invest biannually or on a cycle in an employee enablement engagement survey, right? Survey comes back for this organization, fairly progressive organization, and they bomb on the question, which I felt was a really neat way that that, that company, that vendor asked that question. Is it safe to say what you think around here? They really failed on that question. Interestingly, that particular question, aligning with similar questions in, the, in that category or driver that was in that um, survey, and that's where their executive wanted to focus on. It made them mad. Like all emotion around getting better is good. Like mm -hmm. 
and and Mad's one of them. If you can get a, a group of executives that are mad at survey results, amazing because all engagement is good. Yeah. You know, when employees are really upset and are just mad at the organization and they need this to be better and I can't get, that doesn't mean you have a bad engagement survey. You actually have a pretty good engagement survey because they're engaged. Yeah. They're telling you. <laughs> right? It wasn't so, an approval rating you know, right. survey. It's an engagement survey. Yeah. You got are good they, feedback and participation. Right. Yeah. A, a poor engagement survey result is one where you have super low participation. They They couldn't be cared to tell you. Or they're disenchanted, right? And are and they see that there's glaring challenges in an organization, but they couldn't even want to provide you the effort or time they have. That's disengagement, right? So any level of engagement is great. So this this is what I saw out of the executive, and they said, "Well, what do you mean? It's not safe to say what you think." And you know, if you think about the systems in an organization, executive. Uh, depending on the size of the organization, but very senior leadership have have a lot less exposure to the larger employee group. So they took it. They took that as a direct finger point at them and the way that they're leading the organization. And if 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 it's not safe to say what you think, it must start with them. And so I thought, okay, well, they're really engaged and mad. This is great. So we actually looked at a campaign because they were like, safe to say what? Like not safe to say about how to improve something. Safe to say about our uniforms. Parking spots, not safe to say what you think in a meeting. What, what is this? So it was actually a multi-month campaign asking the questions of leaders in smaller groups with employees. Hey, you know, this is one of the, the uh, results that we're very concerned about, but we need more information and what could that look like? And that was a really good example in that organization, because I know a year later when they did this survey, I think that they went up about 27 to 28 points on that. Wow. It was a significant change. And in the meantime, there were different practices and processes that were built into the organization, into the structure to improve people's opportunity to say what they think. So, for example, if I was in a meeting before I've made these massive improvements that I've made, I would be the one sucking up all the oxygen in the room. Well, advancement for safe to say what you think is maybe somebody that is uh, has more space. There's opportunity. There's an agenda that invites genuine participation, right? Mm -hmm. So if, if I were to sort of summarize, and I always feel like i got to kind of summarize and put things in their place, that's maybe just my bias, yeah. is that we've been talking about leadership and that leadership, when you check in with your core values, if your core values are about your followers and maximizing their contribution, their potential, you have to change some leadership behaviors that invite that participation, that create that relationship, that acknowledgement, um, and creates a relationship. And, and keep in mind, like there's management looks or leadership looks different in many organizations. I think of, um, a nurse manager on a on a nursing unit may have um, 50, 60, 70 direct reports. Their span of control is huge. Other leaders might have a small group of leaders. But what you're saying is that uh, that leadership makes a difference. And it's it's looking at leadership as a mode of change, a vehicle of change for psychological health and safety versus let's start with um, trying to make a change in the factors. So for example, like if, if someone uses guarding minds at work, they'll get a survey that um, comes with results in the 13 different factors. So we'll talk about leadership and expectations, involvement and influence, organizational culture, uh, civility and respect, workload, work-life balance. It'll look at all these things. And so instead of saying, well, here, let's go try to tackle a variable first, you're saying if we work on leadership and we invite participation, we invite feedback, we develop that relationship, we're probably going to get all this other stuff, or at least we've got a, a reasonable chance of getting that, that other stuff. Is that, is that sort of a fair summary of, of your experience and your read being on the ground in organizations? Right. So I do agree. I, that is the read that I have, that that you suspend both at the same time. So mm -hmm. my advice for organizations that haven't perhaps formalized some goals around implementing a framework or advancing is to get working on both at the same time. Recognize the importance within leadership um, that the other components within 
the structure of the full system of an organization is there needs to be some commitments. So, you know, uh, starting back a few years ago and implementing a national standard for psychological health and safety, you know, you start with a commitment from leadership that's written down and it's on the wall and it says, we're going to commit to being this. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's important to start with that. And, you know, the example that you gave around a nursing unit, when there's a 50 to one ratio or a hundred to one ratio, then that, that manager might feel, God, my opportunity for influence is really low, but start with those commitments and expectations, then work with your um, charge nurses or smaller um, uh, leaders of the individual contributors, you know, look at those pieces and start working to say, this is our expectations of behavior and way of ways of being here. And, this is what we're going to collectively work together. So look, work within that system to get that going, but also do get started on some fundamental pieces around an amazing structure like the national standard in those 13 factors. And that is the systemic approach or the approach that I believe <clears throat> is easier for leaders to get started with because it's tangible. They can have it, you know, they can, they could uh, do a survey like, the beauty of, of the Guardian Minds at Work survey is, is it's free. You know, mm -hmm. click the link online. It's free. Do it as many times as you want. Make sure you use that information. But you, you can get some results right away and create that framework. That for leaders is um, a bit of an easier start because they can understand that that's tactile. And then they can look at some of their processes or policies in place. Many of these things speak to policy. Mm -hmm. You know, let's, let's dig out our policy and see... Can this be improved to improve psychological safety? What's our policy on call-in procedures for a sick day? That's a big one, right? right. Like, what's the call-in procedure? How are you supposed to do it? Is it safe? Is it a text? Is it a phone call? Oh, those are hard. So, right. So, you know, this, this is a really big, broad subject. But what yeah. you're saying is, it, it, you say it comes down to leadership commitment. You know, so when you yeah. senior leadership develops a policy and says, "This is what we're going to do." That's really important. But an individual leader who checks in with themselves and says, my personal leadership philosophy is, it doesn't matter if I haven't seen it on the wall in the boardroom or the ELT isn't doing this, checking with myself, my personal leadership um, values are about connecting and um, inviting people into um, relationship and being authentic, right? And, mm -hmm. and that's where you said it sort of all starts there. Um, so I'm, I'm sort of curious then, um, there's been lots of talk about how maybe generations are different or that, you know, um, people who are up and coming um, are emerging leaders, you know, think differently or whatnot. And, and you've had the opportunity to do some lecturing um, as you get into the lecture theater and in the university. Um, what's something that you've observed or that you've learned then um, as you're developing leaders in that way? You know, so I had an opportunity last year to, um, it was a third year business class at the University of Regina. I was brought in as a guest lecturer yeah. for this group. Um, the, um, really excited future HR practitioners and, and business leaders, right? Um, and they asked me to, it was a connection through a connection, et cetera. And it was a wonderful um, time for me to come in and talk about mental fitness and psychological safety. I love talking about mental fitness. I love talking, as you know, about building personal mental fitness practices. And I talk about, I live with generalized anxiety disorder. So I've had mm -hmm. to, um, you know, I think it's important to to be open and reduce stigma. So I now I've done that with a couple of hundred more new people said that. But um, I, so I, I love talking about mental fitness and building a personal mental fitness practice. What does that look like? Because everybody can relate to that. It's important for everybody uh, in their own uh, personal health. So I talked to them about that and as well as psychological safety. So I had a couple of hours in front of these students and I recognized that they had so many questions and they were so enthralled. And I must've had three or four students that talked about their own current personal health challenges that they were having, whether it was related to school or um, stress and concern. And, you know, we just really had some good back and forth dialogue. And I was also so um, inspired that they were so they were so excited about this is a field like psychological safety, mental health in the workplace is a thing. I thought I was going to go into you know 
compensation and benefits or labor relations or something like this is a thing. There's a person that's employed that helps advance this. And I got to talk to them and said, you know, it's a growing profession of practitioners mm -hmm. that it might not be what you get to do for your whole job, but everybody has that opportunity within an organization. And this is critically important. And what I, what I did recognize, and, and it made me think as I drove back from the university, I had so many thoughts going on, but one of them was, geez, we have to really recognize the whole uh, generation in, in the workplace and respect different thoughts and ideas, and that this is the next workforce. And many of our leaders are a little more advanced in their career. They've been around like me, been around for a little while, you know, and perhaps have some of those more uh, uh, traditional thoughts or, or uh, different workplace thoughts than what the new workforce and ideas that the new workforce has. And so I do want, you know, not to just add more things that, that leaders need to, to perhaps be focused and aware of is, but just to be open to the idea of bias, uh, be curious about the different demographics in your workplace. And that could be youth in the workplace or younger workers that could be diverse cultures and, and, and many different things, but do recognize that we can't paint everyone with the same brush that in general, everybody wants to be successful. Mm -hmm. I don't know why that makes me emotional, but you know, people want to contribute, yeah. do a good job during the day and feel like somebody told them they did a great job. Mm -hmm. And connected and drive home and want to feel that they, they want to come back the next day and rinse and repeat. You know, that's that's the general workplace value and get paid every two weeks. <laughs> that pay is important, too. Yeah. You know, when you when you talk about that across generations, I think, you know, and I know our time is limited here, but like sometimes people kind of paint this picture that one generation is like this and one generation is like that. But really, we're all people. And you know, to say that, you know, one generation wants to be coddled and told that they're doing a great job. Um, maybe that's just more evident that they've been vocal about needing that because workers mm. across the spectrum need to be told they're doing a good job. Um, a lack of feedback is a psychological hazard. And so maybe older workers, other generations have just learned that, yeah, I'm not going to get that here and tempered their expectations. But what you've said is that as you were in that lecture theater, you're learning that there are a lot of diverse viewpoints out there. And for a leader to be able to lead well and check in with their folks, they're going to need to develop that relationship. They're going to need to be authentic. They're going to need to give airtime in a meeting. And by those leadership behaviors, you're going to create a psychologically safe container like the workplace and it gives us an opportunity to talk about the work, talk about our experience here at work, because inevitably that's going to determine whether or not we are healthy as a group of workers or not. You talk about the, the workforce capital that's been your passion. And so leader yeah. behavior just has a ton to do with that. Yeah, absolutely. And, and there, there are perhaps different expectations um, that are coming into the workforce and, and areas. And that's all great. And people, you know, you, you would have, um, you're well read and insatiable about academics and back and, and things like that. But, you know, the things that you we learn and more and more we understand around different generations in the workforce is that it's just a different preference in how to get things done. So if I could offer to leaders to, you know, lead or invite with a compass rather than a map, mm -hmm. right? You know, invite for workers, uh, employees, et cetera, identify these are our outcomes. These are the objectives. I want to make sure you have all the tools you have. Do you have the training? Do you have the tools? Do you have the systems? Do you have those things? Um, but allow them to be creative and independent and in how they reach that goal, you know, within constructs of safety and things like that. Mm -hmm. But um, it's my understanding and it's been my experience that uh, providing a compass for them to find their way to get there versus a map um, in exactly the ways that I got there, my 30 years and, you know, that sort of thing is going to be, and I don't mean to be disrespectful to, I'm an older leader, um, that, that that will be much more effective and, and learn what that could look like. And the, yeah, there's a recent uh, large meta-analysis that was done of leadership styles and followers' mental health, which 
says that, that servant leadership, transformative leadership, you know, where you're outlining the outcomes rather than the methods does mm-hmm. contribute to better follower mental health. So, all right. So we've gone on a, we've gone on a nice journey here talking about leadership. And I really appreciate that, Jay. If people are interested in learning more or they want to connect with you or they want to uh, follow you, um, how do you want people to get in touch with you? Like, obviously, you're employed, but then you also maintain an independent practice. Um, how do you want people to get in touch with you? Uh, you know, through LinkedIn would probably be the easiest uh, that a person could connect with me there. Have sent me a note and looking for any of my thoughts or on research and components. And and yeah, you know, as as I present here today, you know, I'm it's a wonderful Friday vacation day for me, and I'm going to get to spend the day with my dogs and my grandson and um, but today, you know, I, I would see this time that I've spent and what I'm offering is to the industry, to leaders and to the industry of psychological health and safety, you know, as a practitioner and that's been in this field for some time. And I'm always really open and excited about connecting with others. And we, you would know, we've worked in a field our whole careers where sharing everything we know mm-hmm. and sharing different policies and programs and anything we have across industry is is the standard you know yeah. for health or safety in cl- clinic work uh and so i'm happy to continue that on with anybody that listened today that maybe thought something was intriguing or that i'd have some value in a conversation so i think probably through linkedin would be great and you know happy to uh to connect awesome thanks Jay. and you're absolutely right like uh the purpose of this podcast Uh, for listeners is to rapidly expand the knowledge and practices around psychological health and safety. So uh, Kim McDonald, my co-host, myself, we do this as a volunteer thing. This podcast is obviously sponsored by Flourish DX, a company in Australia, but we are looking to get the message out. Um, Social change, um, developing expectations, improving people's confidence. And so these podcasts are about that this is not impossible. And that's why we have folks from the field like Jay who are like, you know what, we're doing this. And so, you know, connecting with us, please connect with us on LinkedIn, um, hit the like and subscribe, all the other buttons there that help to um, get this message out because we do want to raise awareness that psychological health and safety, mental health in the workplace is not some sort of untouchable, undoable thing. Uh, previous podcasts with, um, uh, Kevin Moon, we talked about low cost, no cost. Nothing that Jay has said here today is going to cost you a lot. It's about doing some things differently that create a real difference in your workplace. It's going to make a big difference for your worker experience. It's going to make a big difference in how you as a group are able to function. So, Jay, I want to say thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate our, our ongoing uh, chats and the the catalyst you've been in my own development. So I want to thank you for coming and sharing with all the listeners. Thanks very much, Ian. You have a terrific, terrific day. All right. Thanks so much. See ya. You've been listening to the Psych Health and Safety Canada podcast. To stay up to date with the best content on workplace mental health in North America, subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts and join the Flourish DX community at www.flourishdx.com. Thank you.